This program has been approved for one IDCEC CEU. To receive credit for this program, please submit your full name, IDCEC number, program class code, and your summary essay to CEU at IIDA.org. The program class code is located alongside the title of this program on the IIDA Academy page. For a certificate of completion to use toward another certifying body, please submit the same information to CEU at IIDA.org. Thank you. Good late afternoon, early afternoon, wherever you might be joining us from. I'm Cheryl Durst, the Executive Vice President and CEO of IIDA, the International Interior Design Association. I'm so glad that you're joining us uh, today uh, from wherever you're joining us from, from your office, from your home office, from your car, from your third place, whatever place you can find some good Wi-Fi. And that's actually the context of our conversation today. Um, work, place, space, and time. We all know that there have been some shifts in how we think about um, how we approach our work, the places where work happens, um, whether we're hybrid, some form of hybrid, flexed, agile, kind of all the things. And I, and I am very honored today to be joined by um, a panel of experts who have such depth and breadth and width in the, the scope of, uh, of this topic. So we have joining us Ann Gibson, who is Vice President and National Practice Leader for Nelson, and Christopher Keller, who's a Design Leader uh, for Interiors for Stantec, and Suzette Subantz, who's the Managing Executive with TPG Architecture. Hi, Ann, Chris, Suzette, how's everybody? Good, thank you. Great, Good. great. Perfect. I know, Anne, you're at your home office, yes? That's right. All right. Chris, are you are you at Stantec? You in the I, office? I am in the office. Okay. And Suzette, where are you I'm, today? I'm in the office. All right. Okay. I'm in my home office. So we've got we've got team home and team at office today. <laughs> um and let's why don't we start right there? Um clearly um, a multiplicity of ways to work. Um, we know that that's definitely here to stay. And what does that mean? What does that mean for us right now in kind of the larger sense, in a design sense, in a culture sense, in a being engaged and attached to work sense? What does that mean now? Um, and what might that mean? Let's start out with being a little predictive. What might that mean 10 years from now? Who wants to kick us off? Oh, no one's going first. Sure, I'll do it. Um, okay, Chris. <laughs> I know. Uh, as you said, Cheryl, billable hours, responsible for time. <laughs> so we'll keep it moving. Um, I think really what we've noticed or what I've noticed is this is about being able to uh, learn more about respect and trust. Mm -hmm. So respecting how people work and trusting that the work is going to get done when it means doing it in a different way. Than it has been done before. So now when you want people to feel safe and you want to provide choice so people can do their best work, um, the pressures on technology and how to make people feel connected, I think all of those things are something that we're learning a great deal about and they are here to stay. I don't think they're going to be going anywhere. Yeah. yeah, and I think building on that, I'm hearing more about, you know, just empathy, just the idea of what's happening in each other's lives. So in some ways, even though we are not necessarily next to each other, we're sharing more. Um, we're talking about what's happening in our lives. And it might be because we are in our home life and our puppy came to play or our kids, you know, are home because they're not feeling well. But I think there's there's a level of empathy that um, I'm seeing at every level of the organization. You, you see the C-suite the CEOs that you're talking about, talking to who understand what they're the, what the employees are going through. Like I need to be flexible because, um, you know, maybe my assistant or someone there is um, experiencing this or 
or may need some flexibility because of X, Y, and Z. So I think that idea of like trust, you know, flexibility and just empathy in general. Yeah, there's that awareness of our humanness now, which is ironic because we're all so digital, but it's, you know, that, that blending, I think building that awareness around the lives that we have outside of our day jobs. I mean, I think there was always such a hard line between work and, and non-work. And now because of this blur, um, it's really nice to, to have, as you said, Suzette, the awareness of that sort of need for flexibility, that it's not laziness, that it's we're juggling a million things all day long. Um, and so, you know, the, the whole work experience has the ability to sort of transform around that, which I think is exciting. Mm -hmm. Um, and I love that point you made about this abiding awareness that we have of who our colleagues and coworkers are. Um, moms, dads, pet moms, pet dads, soccer coaches, whatever. You know, we were, you know, pre-pandemic maybe aware of what people did between nine and five or eight and seven, whatever work hours were. But now we're increasingly aware of a full-fledged, uh, the full-fledged life lives that people had. And I don't know that people were necessarily bringing their whole selves to work. It's a great expression, but I, we're certainly seeing more um, of folks' wholehearted selves and who they are outside of the, the workplace. Um, yeah, and I think, oh, sorry, yeah, sure. yeah, I, I was no, just going to say, I think that makes for a richer organization. You know, it's like, it's almost bringing everybody's, you know, full spectrum you know, into, into that, that circle of, of, you know, team and, and collaboration and sort of understanding that there's, there are all these multiple dimensions to your teammates that maybe weren't visible before, I think adds a layer of, of depth to everything that we do. Yeah. And I think like, sorry, I'm going to just add to, yeah. you know, it's, and, you know, being a working mom in the past, there was always like this kind of like divide. And I know I'm sure other people on this call understand what I'm talking about because you didn't really talk about your kids or anything because, you know, maybe your peers weren't doing that who may not have been, you know, as involved. But it, it, like now there's more of a sharing and there's more of an understanding because we've seen the, you know, behind the curtain of everyone's lives in, in one way or the other. And, and that might be from the celebrity level to, you know, um, just the person who's sitting next to you. And I think that's allowed us to be human, be more human and be more present in, in what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, um, this added factor of being more human um, has greatly affected when we're in the office, how we interact and I heard a great statistic recently that the average meeting, um, you'd spend maybe three minutes before the meeting started kind of catching up. Now that three minutes has expanded to 17 minutes. So it has to be managed a little bit, but people are checking in and catching up. And maybe someone has come into that meeting that's been working remotely. And people are acutely aware of, again, those extra added aspects of others' lives. And so they're checking in on, on those things as well. So you know, just that tenor and tone of even meetings being a little more human for better or for worse. Um, um, Chris, how has your return to the workplace informed how you're thinking about the work that you're doing for your clients? How has that informed workplace design for you? Well, I, I think one of the things that we've done is from the very beginning, we, we implemented a pretty flexible policy. We made a uh, we made it known that we had uh, preferences about when people were going to be in it. It was for the express concern of maintaining the culture of the office. But we also left it open-ended so that if there needed to be adjustments, people were free to do so. Um, but I, I think what it's done is it's taught us that people really do care about being around each other and they're starting to find ways to get here, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to saying it's just easier for us to you know, throw on a tracksuit and stay at home and work, um, which I've been guilty of several times. But I think that um, we're really starting to understand that people want to be here together and that they realize that the work is so much more fun and rewarding when you're able to do it together um, and find ways within that, and this is very important, to make people feel safe and comfortable because that facilitates the most productive work environment. Yeah. 
It's not about the furniture necessarily. It's not about even the amenities. It's about making people feel safe and comfortable so that when they come here, their mind is free to think about the things they need to think about, which is serving our clients. Yeah. So way before attributes and amenities, um, it's, you're thinking about feeling before anything else. Right. Annie or Susan? Yeah, I think, you know, we we really implemented a flexible policy and we it's fairly still, it's still very flexible. We have some parameters. Um, it's interesting because I think people are coming in and it's not necessarily, again, about the amenities. It's sometimes it's just to connect with others. Um, and it's funny, the FOMO happens because people haven't seen people. It's like, oh, oh, wait, I'm on a Zoom call and four out of the you know, eight people are all in the office. Oh God, I want to be there. I want to, uh -huh. I want to have those conversations. And I am starting to see more of that where um, people want to be a part of being in the know and, and be able to share. So it's, it's a different thing. And, you know, for our clients, they're wrestling with this and many of them didn't have spaces to necessarily bring people together. So we've been talking all about all these like ancillary spaces, but, and they're building it, but it's, I think it's the people, you know, yes, you, you build it. Yeah. But if you get the people together, people, it, it'll start growing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would say um, what I've noticed and I've been at Nelson for about a year and a half now. And um, you know, it's what I've, what I've noticed and, and I've seen this for, you know, before I was at Nelson is that a lot of the more experienced generations want everybody to come in and be together because that's how they learn. And, um, through observation and, and sort of over the shoulder kind of stuff. And what I've noticed is that um, in our office in particular, or in several of our offices, it's real, it is really the younger um, generations that do want to be in because they want to be together. Um, and, you know, it's, it's the opportunity to socialize and to, you know, see what each other, you know, even if they're not working on the same project together, they're sort of seeing what each other is doing um, and kind of checking in. And I think you know, that, that sort of, um, it, that cultural piece is like what we're trying to build, you know, for our clients or figure out how to get that kind of magical stuff to happen. Um, so I'm, I'm encouraged by that. Um, you know, the young kids are going to teach us the way, <laughs> show us the way. <laughs> I think too, just to maybe build on that for a minute is one of the things that we try to take great care in doing is making sure that throughout this sort of digital hiccup, that we had uh, throughout the pandemic that the concept of mentorship was thought about, considered and maybe reevaluated and tweaked so that people didn't feel like they were losing ground in their career trajectory. And I think that became a little harder, maybe not even a little, maybe a lot harder um, when we were working from home. And I think that's also one of the reasons people come back is because they feel like, you know, we were in the conversation that we had earlier in the green room relative to how maybe some children have responded to this relative to their school and how those function. We want people to come back so that they learn how to be together and they feel like they're being taught and they don't lose time in their, in their career path. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's something that we've had to work hard to figure out how to make sure that we maintain mm -hmm. while we were having adjusting to the new work. Yeah. Right. And you know, we're business about relationships and we, we discussed that and, and it's not just relationships with our clients, it's relationships with our colleagues and also the relationship with the industry. Um, we're like one of the most social industries out there. Um, one of the, you know, when we started having vendors back in, it was so great to see my, you know, the sealed sales reps or start going out and having lunch with people. Like it's, um, it's a really big family and it's an extended family. And I think uh, it's, it's something I know I've missed. And even when I was working from home, I had, you know, met with sales reps like in the local coffee shop because we just crave to be together and, and feed off of each other. So mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's something that's really been difficult in this time. Behaviorists and social psychologists are saying definitely for the remainder of 2022 and for a fair part of 2023, we as a culture and society are in reunion mode. And, you know, it's the reconnecting to one another, um, being reintroduced to the work that we do, being reintroduced to our teams, often in some aspects, relearning how to be um, part of a team or relearning if you're a part of organizations like IIDA, relearning what it means to, 
you know, be a volunteer and to be a part of an organization, um, all of the reads, right? And so um, this reconnection, um, you know, how is design supporting um, how we are all reconnecting at work? Any thoughts on that? What are, what are we doing as a community in helping clients reconnect? What role does design play in that? You know, it's it's interesting, and I'll refer to really some of the newer spaces that we're designing. Yeah. Pre, pre-pandemic, um, there were companies that were talking about hospitality and bringing hospitality, right? And that was a huge uh, trend that we saw across the workplace. And then the pandemic happened, and it was almost the one thing people were afraid of. They were afraid of like being together in large groups in the same area, sharing, um, you know, who touched that glass last, who touched the surface. Um, But now we're seeing that reintroduction of hospitality because that's what makes us feel most comfortable. And that's what brings people together. Um, The other thing that we're seeing is really creating a more diverse workplace. Mm -hmm. And in some ways that's bringing people together because you're creating the spaces that are collaborative spaces, spaces where people can gather, but also spaces where people can have privacy. So it's really creating both types of spaces and that goes back to the different ways that people work. So if you can provide the spaces that address everyone, you know, the the different creature comforts, right? That that uh, neurodiversity, then you're able to bring people to the office because they they know that they can come here and find a place to have a quiet, to have a call Mm -hmm. or to just sit down and do heads down work. Mm -hmm. I think that's so important, Suzette. And I think like, you know, pre-pandemic, we were designing, you know, activity-based workplaces and, you know, making sure that there were spaces for specific tasks. And I think an interesting shift now that we're looking um, looking at, our clients are looking at, is is more of a behavioral based design. You know, what are the types of spaces that can support, um, you know, a, a, a behavior or a um, support someone's neurodiversity? Um, you know, a lot all of us have bad days, and sometimes you know we need like that heads down space, even if we're an extrovert, or you know we might feel comfortable in in a more open space um, to feel more connected to people. And I think it's not just about um, sort of space where you can be your most productive for the work that you're producing, but more almost more of like, what kind of spaces do people need to be in the right mindset, um, Mm -hmm. to have that sort of physical, emotional, mental comfort um, to feel safe. What Chris was saying earlier, you know, that sense of safety um, and that, of course, connects to belonging and inclusion and, and respect and trust and all of, again, Chris, what you were saying at the, at the onset of this conversation, all of that stuff, you know, speaks volumes to understanding that we as humans have individual needs. We've started looking at things differently, just to build on both of that from Suzanne and Anne. That, um, Suzette, I'm sorry. Uh, we started thinking about looking at the work spl- workplace uh, in, in through the lens of, of relationships, right? So we talked about, you know, Suzette, you referred to that that we're and Anne both, you talked about how we're a very social industry and you know, we know how to do things together. But when you look at the relationship between uh, someone in their peers, someone in their manager group, someone in their mentees, the relationship with their work, with their workflow and what they need to produce you start to craft kind of a bespoke approach for laying out the spaces that are going to be specific for them and what their people expect and need um, to do all of those things. So I think that when you start to think about the space as the thing that facilitates the relationships that that organization needs, not just for how they work, but how they need to feel together, you start to get almost into a scenario planning that, that makes it feel like it's a really specific kind of space that we have done exactly for them. And I think that's really important because it's gonna be different across the board for whomever it is you're working for at that time. Well, and also Chris, different from day to day, I've been hearing a lot of people talk about the new cadence that we have from Monday through Friday. And um, Tuesday has become the new Monday. Um, If you're able to have the ability to work, um, uh, to flex your work and, 
uh, choose your two days or your three days in the office. Um, cities across the country have seen traffic patterns change on Tuesday. Um, Mondays are much quieter than they were, um, but I'm hearing people talk about they are seeing the their quieter, more introverted employees choose to come in on Mondays and Fridays because most people aren't selecting Mondays and Fridays. And so quite uh, more introverts, more people who want to get heads down work done, people who want to have quieter meetings are coming into the office on Mondays and Fridays. The activity days are Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then Wednesday seems to be, you know, a little bit social, but still that's the day that people choose for returning phone calls and emails. So it's interesting that the, just the cadence of Monday and Friday, and now we're looking at personality types, um, you know, who are tagging certain days to come in. Um, so it becomes, you know, one more interesting layer of, of data to pay attention to, but also thinking about how a workplace can feel different now on different days? I think one of the most interesting things um, coming, you know, in the times that we're living in is you're seeing more and more leaders at, at organizations really talking about culture. Um, they were starting to at the beginning of, you know, pre-pandemic about how workplace supported culture, but even more so now. Mm -hmm. um, really a focus on how and and it's again bringing that humanistic approach it's like it's about your people it's like how do we support your people so a lot of the work that we've been doing involves a strategy a workplace strategy component because it's really about doing more in-depth research beyond a program really uh, really understanding and workshopping with their people and their managers and at different levels like what what do they need and I think Chris, it goes back to that more bespoke approach and more, more people that you would never have thought of would have approached strategy or think about strategy or thinking about it now. Well, and I think what's also interesting too is if you if you think about it in the context of you know, the relationship to the to the, of the person to the space, it becomes a common denominator for, for people in that you know, some people look at things very quantitatively. The C-suite may want things. You know, we have a certain amount of money per square foot that we're willing to spend and we have to maximize that. But then, you know, your brand ambassador in the office is looking at it from a qualitative and experiential standpoint. But I think if you think about the, the relationship of the person to the space and how you craft that for them, I think that's something that everyone can get behind because they realize the value of it okay. in both capacities. Mm -hmm. um, prioritizing um, mental and emotional health um, is, is critical in this time period. And as well as the conversation around sustainability and climate change, um, what conversations, what conversations are you all having with your clients along the lines, right? And to me, this all falls under the, with this um, umbrella that we talk about, um, that social people forward, um, social justice, um, Suzette, you use the phrase very, um, humanistic, um, how are conversations around sustainability along with equity and the equity of experience and climate change factoring into the conversations you're having now with clients? I think things like um, climate change and sustainability are come naturally to clients. Yeah. That's the easy one. Um, yeah. Things like DEI and equity, diversity, and inclusion is the stuff that doesn't necessarily. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I find that and, and I don't mean that in a negative way. It's just, it's not a part of the vocabulary. And right. sometimes it's not thinking about it. They understand ADA because that's a law, um, but it's almost, we're bringing more ideas to the table in terms of different, the diversity of spaces. How can you do things with lighting, materials? Uh, just the, And that is something that um, I think the design community really needs to bring forward. And you know, you do it in subtle ways. There are subtle ways to do it and to introduce those ideas that can make for a more inclusive environment. You know, I, I talk about, you know, we always have an ADA bathroom. Can that be a gender neutral bathroom? Like that's that's just taking it and labeling it diff slightly different. And once you introduce that to your client, oh, they're like, oh yeah, of course. Like it, it doesn't even become, but if, if we never bring it to the table to say, 
Or is there a room that you might want to dedicate for someone who has a migraine? So it's a wellness mm. room outside of a mother's room, you know, mm-hmm. things like that. All of a sudden it starts to resonate with people because it, it's bringing that humanistic element again and, and having that conversation. So, yeah. you know, I always encourage designers to ask the questions or bring the ideas to the table. You know, some are taken and some people embrace them and some aren't embraced, but you know, if we don't bring it to the table, I don't think it's going to, we're not going to be able to move this forward. Yeah. yeah. And where have you seen some shifts in conversations with your clients? Yeah, I think, I mean, I, Suzette, I like what you said about it, you know, us bringing it forward. Cause I really do think, you know, we as designers need to be ambassadors for the people that we are design. We are helping our clients design for. Right. And so I remember 15 years ago, fighting for a mother's room on a project. Like this is not the same thing as a wellness room. Those need, those two shouldn't mix. Um, and, and now that is, you know, mother's rooms are just a given, you know, in, in almost every project that I'm, that I'm working on right now, I'm encouraged to see more openness to a lot of different types of spaces, like prayer rooms, having that be something separate from a wellness room that, you know, these, blending, mushing all of these things together in sort of one singular type of space isn't, it's almost like putting everybody in a one size fits all open plan office. You know, there's, I'm encouraged that there's starting to be a little bit of recognition that like, these are unique things that serve unique purposes for unique, you know, experiences and should not just be a one size fits all kind of a space. So I love that, you know, we're, we've got foot washing sinks that we're putting into spaces and you know, places for mats and, and a dedicated room for a nap versus, you know, something that is for somebody who isn't feeling well. So um, I, I do think, you know, and then the more that we can bring that up in the process of like, these are different types of spaces that you can be considering, especially now, if you're trying to draw people back into the office, like the more options that you can have for people um, to, to have more of those not even comforts of home, but but maybe like assurances of flexibility, um, I think will help people feel more comfortable in, you know, adjust slowly adjusting their schedules or routines, you know, coming back to the office. Yeah. I think what's interesting it. also is that uh, it is something that we've been, we try to push. And I think we all have because we realize it's important and we have a responsibility to do those things. But I also think what we have to remember too is that People go to work for organizations for more than just a paycheck and experience now. They go and they join because they feel like they are in line with the messaging and the culture and they are uh, they subscribe to the same things and they both have, have a level of priority that is specific enough so that they make decisions about their employer uh, uh, with respect to some of these things. So I think as much as we put those things forward, we have to understand that that's what, that's what users are looking for. And they feel like it's it's uh, it's a part of the responsibility of an organization to start to address some of these things because that's what with whom they want to be affiliated. That's great. How um, let me let me address technology, right? Um, for years, I feel like we've been talking about seamless, flawless technology, but obviously, um, as remote work became more prevalent, um, it meant for all of us embracing a lot of new technology. Um, what have you seen uh, from a technology standpoint that has worked? What, you know, what have you embraced from a technological standpoint? What have you seen your clients embrace? Um, even returning to a hybrid workplace has, has caused us to look and think differently about um, the technology to support a hybrid workplace. Does anybody want to jump in on the conversation on technology? Yeah, I'll jump in there, Cheryl. I, um, I have a client that is um, really progressive in terms of this type of technology. And right now they're just testing ideas. They've taken over, I don't know, 10,000 square feet of a, of a floor um, to try new ideas and they're testing holograms and it is the coolest thing ever. And I thought, you know, initially when all of this happened, I, I thought the only way this is gonna work is if somebody like a virtual person can be sitting right next to me in a chair. And this client is testing that out and it's really cool. Um, it's very in, in its infancy stage, but I think you know that type of um, 
the separation from the screen has to happen in order for this to really be effective. Yeah. Um, I'm sure we've all experienced how ineffective it is if half the people are in a room and half the people are on the screen or even, you know, whatever the split is, if there isn't that equity of the experience, right. Right. somebody or some people are going to be missing out um, on the full engagement. So I think what I've been seeing is lots of testing. We're encouraging prototyping with our clients. Like, let's not spend a lot of money. Let's just try out some, you know, things on plywood or stuff we can move around and, and try in different positions and angles within existing spaces um, to see what might work best before a big investment in sort of infrastructural changes. That's great. That's great. Chris, yeah, the concept of prototyping, which I think has been very native to like tech companies in general, is starting to be introduced uh, throughout. Um, I think, you know, it's interesting because I think pre-pandemic, you there was a big concern about um, people who were not digital natives, right, and who might be left behind. And um, in some ways, the pandemic kind of equalized the playing field. Um, I never thought I'd be doing FaceTime with my mom, but I do. And, you know, with my cousins in other countries. And I think there's something about that equalization that is now created that digital equity that we talk about. And, you know, just furthering that is really important. So it's it's being more flexible with technology, whereas I think in the past, it was always like, okay, it's that room, you got to go there. You know, now it's technology is everywhere. And um, I think everyone feels a level of comfort to be able to, to reach out and connect with someone. Yeah. You, Suzette, just used two words um, that I want, I want to play with just a little bit. And talking about kind of this apt, flawless use of technology, but then how we marry that with comfort. And Chris, I think at the beginning of the conversation, you talked about comfort and safety. Um, where are we seeing aspects of comfort um, because so many of us, um, depending on how we lived through the lived through the pandemic, we spent a lot of it at home. And so, you know, there are elements of home um, that you know are now we're now seeing more of in the workplace. Um, so, how do we? How are we marrying those two things? And what elements of comfort um, are we seeing being introduced or reintroduced into the workplace? I think you're you're starting to see things. You know, if you equate or you realize the progression between being comfortable and creating an environment for yourself where you're going to be productive uh, to your greatest capacity, I think it has to do a little bit with control. And flexibility can get in there a little bit too. But if you can control the noise, if you can control your privacy, if you can control your lighting, if you can control what you see visually or who can see you, that's what's appealing about home is that you can adjust that however you would like. I think in the workplace, what we're starting to see is, although it's not 100% adjustable or customizable at any given moment, we're starting to see moves made where the, the choice of those environments are offered and then the, the manipulation of that environment within that selection is starting to become more prevalent. So it started with easy things like, you know, the safety screens between workstations. Now it has to do with focus rooms where you adjust the light, you adjust the temperature, you can adjust the privacy, you can adjust the height, you can adjust the seating style. You can start to do all of those things. And what's good about those is it not only caters to the individual user that is able to change those, but it, it also appeals to the people responsible for making the financial decisions to put those things in there because they realize the level of efficiency that it, it can move across a lot of different, uh, it can be a lot of different venues. So I think that's what we're, st we're starting to see. Yeah. And I also want to stress um, when we have that conversation about comfort, we're not just talking about physical comfort, we're talking about emotional mm -hmm. comfort, um, psychological safety as well. And some of the, you know, some of the very specific and bespoke interventions that Anne was talking about um, start to address, you know, how you as a person um, feel emotionally safe and comfortable in a space as well. You start seeing it, you know, oh, sorry. You no, know, no, go ahead. I think, you know, just the idea of, you know, bringing a lot of the touches of residential, um, you know, having those diverse spaces. So the types of, you know, furniture that we're specifying is, um, you know, just a little bit softer. You're definitely seeing more ideas about lighting. Um, it's funny, I remember 
a while ago, you know, seeing like the, the little portable, you know, LED lights that you can charge, a chargeable ones. And, oh yeah, those were great for the thinking about outdoor spaces. Well, now it's great to have it next to your desk because it gives you better illumination for your Zoom call. You know, I think it's, it's, people are really thinking about accessories and, and just like different ways of personalizing space, um, but yet keeping it very professional. Yeah, I was going to add to that too, that, you know, I think the, the quality of space is shifting. While there might be less of it that companies are taking on, um, the, the quality of the acoustics needs to be better. The quality of, you know, obviously the HVAC systems and filtration, um, but really thinking about like those personal touches of making a room kind of, you know, softer so that it deadens the sound a little bit, um, that that sort of comfort, as you said, Cheryl, you know, isn't necessarily just about your seat or your desk, but you know, how the whole experience feels to you. Our expectations or clients' expectations um, have really been heightened. Um, you know, yeah. our expectations, not just from around technology, but the quality of the connections that we have and the quality of engagement and just, and the physical attributes and the quality of the space that work is happening in have just um, have just exponentially been heightened, which makes your jobs all the more intriguing and interesting. Well, I think you know I, I'm sure we have all believed that space is a tool for our clients. They have lots of different tools in their tool belt, and space is a really big one to impact their business. Um, I, we, I recently just started, um, on a new law firm project and the client said to me, do you know how much pressure there is on this space? It's got to do a lot. There's so much that it can do. And I was just like, yes, <laughs> it, it's really important. And I'm glad, I'm really glad that our clients are starting, you know, more of our clients are starting to realize that. I think there were always some who are more, our more progressive clients, certainly in the tech industry. Um, but to have, you know, a, a prominent legal firm talk about how the quality of the space was really important um, to all of the staff within the space, not just the, their clients, um, I think is a really big sign of, of a shift. Yeah, yeah I we, think we had two law firms that actually hired us for strategy. And in the past, law firms didn't really care about strategy. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it was really, there were a couple of votes that mattered, but now it's like, it's everywhere. But I think that's where it's what's interesting and, and you know what both of you just said it's I think a lot of a lot of what you've seen about people being more uh, more interested in the expectations of Haydn has also been a reaction to the people who are more in tune with the cultural message and the mission of the organization for whom they're working right so before it was just we're going to flood this with workstations we're going to get everybody in here they're going to come in they're going to work and they're going to go home punch the clock, slide down the back of the dinosaur and go home. But I think, I think now there is a reaction saying, okay, people really are demanding more. The talent pool is demanding more. Yeah. And we need to get on board with this and understand why they want it because we're going to be responsible for giving it to them if we want to build the best team in our organization. <clears throat> that, that shift, which has been happening over the years, but that shift to valuing and appreciating how design thinks and not just what design does um, has really become paramount during this period. Um, we are moving into audience Q&A mode. I have, I have one question that I'll use to wrap up um, uh, when we get toward the end of the program, but let's move to some audience questions. And I've got a few, and then I know Team IIDA is going to send me a few more, <clears throat> but let's, uh, let's see. Um, question for the three of you. Is there a connection between companies allowing, allowing hybrid or remote work being linked to younger generation and the C-suite? So do we, are we seeing any demographic imperatives around um, hybrid and remote work? Any any trends and any trends emerging? Um, Suzette, I saw you nod. <laughs> I, I was laughing because I would say uh, advice I would give young designers is is uh, there's still that perception, especially at the older level, at the you know baby boomers to come in. 
Um, there definitely is. And I think it's part of partially it's about mentorship. Um, I work with, a, you know, for me, it's very flexible because I'm uh, I'm a working mother and I have responsibilities at home. And, and I think, uh, you know, I work with designers that are 100% remote and designers that come into the office. And I think uh, just always being, you know, just being understanding on like where people are coming from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are they in the office or not? But I would recommend any designer who's working with a boomer you might want to come in a couple of days. <laughs> Great advice. Great advice. Um, so here, so there's so much information out there. Um, and and Suzette, as you said, clients are increasingly turning to you for strategy. Um, but a question from the audience, how do we best position ourselves to lead the conversation with clients on new workplace design? Um, whoops, I'm sorry. Or how do we continue to be trusted advisors to our clients when we truly don't have all of the data on new workplace scenarios. Um, yeah. There's a lot of great anecdotal information. Um, there's a lot of, you know, we can feel certain things, um, but there's, there's a, on one hand, a lot of data and on, other, on, on the other hand, not enough, but how can we continue to lead that conversation with and become trusted advisors with our clients? I think as you, uh, when you're working with a client, you have to be careful to make sure that you are presenting the, the office solution as an asset for the organization. You have to get them to look at, look at what it's going to do to make things better holistically. And it can't just be, we have to make a destination, we have to make a place productive. It's gotta be, it's gotta be an asset for them all the way around so that the expense is justified, the effort is justified. And when you finally use that space, it, it helps in every capacity that that office encompasses. So it sounds relatively simple, but I think that again, is something, it's a language that almost everybody will speak. I would say too, that the, you know, the, the importance on strategic services in the upfront are, are so much more significant right now. Um, you know, every organization is unique. There are no two firms that are two clients that are the same. They might be in the same industry, but their people are different. Their needs and processes are different. And so, um, you know, that curiosity and research and exploration up front, I think is where we build that trust with our, with our clients. Um, and, you know, all of our clients want data, they want proof, they wanna know what that return on investment is going to be. And in my experience lately, I, I'm just honest, like, you know, we, we're all in this together and we don't really know. So let's, let's, let's prototype stuff. Let's do some beta testing. Let's, you know, see what sticks. Let's talk to your people and see what they want to try out or if they have ideas that can have more of a kind of a, a grassroots um, solution. Yeah. And I, I have found that to be, you know, that's kind of where I was saying this earlier, I think in the green room, like we're in, we're in the build in the business of building relationships that just happen, design happens to be our vehicle. Um, but you know, that, that relationship can happen in, in lots of different ways throughout the process. I think it's building in that flexibility and it's almost like building, you know, you design the 90% and that 10% is the ability to be flexible, whether it's rearranging things, giving the user an ability to make that space their, their own. But I think to Anne's point, you have to be honest with your clients. Um, we're discovering this together. Uh, by listening to one another, we're gonna come up with solutions. And if we build in some flexibility, uh, they, we will at least give them a level of comfort so that as they move forward, they know their space can grow with them. As a society, we're very mid experiment right now. And I think that that honesty and that authenticity um, that we're all living through this and the willingness um, to test, try, prototype, potentially fail. I know that can, can vary via the discipline um, or the segment, um, but there does seem to be a greater openness to let's try this. Um, and then, you know, we're all building case studies within the moment. Mm -hmm. um, in that vein, here's a question from the audience. Um, do you find with more hybrid work styles and fluidly moving from work to home that it is harder for people to turn off 
and compartmentalize and therefore have a higher burn rate? First part of the question. The second part is how do you think companies can help address the need for flexibility, but also reduce burnout? I mean, I, I think question. that's that's been my biggest fear, and even with um, you know the designers I work with and the people I work with is, I I, I call it almost the work life smoothie because it's no there's <laughs> there's no boundary, it just it just kind of blends, and uh, a lot of what we're seeing is, and we're trying to implement it here and also with our clients is you know having a turn off, having a no technology. Uh, we've had clients that say, okay, there's a Fridays are no meeting day, no meetings mm -hmm. on Fridays, so that you can have time to do focus work. Um, because what we're finding, and I'm sure everyone has experienced, is the 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 rolling Zoom meetings and and the Zoom fatigue, and that's really hard. And and that's I think one of my biggest fears as we move forward in this hybrid world is um, I think we're going to have to really make conscious efforts and put in policies to help with the separation of work and life. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's, that's something that uh, we need to do more consciously to help reduce the burnout rate. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of responsibility on people in leadership roles to really, you know, walk that talk. Um, I know, you know, some companies will have mandated 45 minute meetings so that you don't get that back to back but then people slide in 15 minute meetings. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, I think it's um, the more that leadership can kind of set that tone of like, nope, we don't, we don't send emails over the weekend. I don't expect you to respond to anything until Monday. Um, I think that can, that can help with that. But the, the most um, effective way, I think that, that, you know, I've been working with my teammates on it is like set boundaries. And as, as a team, we need to respect each other's boundaries. And again, all goes back to sort of trust and, and relationships. Um, this wasn't our first pandemic as a culture and a society, and it most definitely won't be our last. Um, what are some lessons learned um, from a design standpoint um, for us to make sure to hold on to those lessons so that we're better prepared um, to help our clients face the next pandemic. That's a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna jump in. Yeah. All right. One thing that's come up that's pretty interesting is we've had a couple clients um, really dig in and, and investigate how the remote user feels as included in the organization's culture as the quote unquote live yeah live user. So um, we we have a client right now that uh, does uh, digital learning um, uh, collateral and they have a lot of satellite offices. And so we've been going through a lot of exercises with them about you know how do we make them feel like they're part of the organization even though they might be in Pittsburgh. And uh, how do we make them feel like they're just as present or just as heard as the people who are live or not even live, but in the, at the headquarters city, so to speak. So um, I think those are something, those are lessons that we're gonna continue to learn because I think that's a longer process. We don't have the, we don't have the answers right now, but I, I'm actually impressed and encouraged by the fact that it's recognized and it's a, a, there's effort from leadership put toward figuring out how to solve that problem. Great. Where are you seeing clients reallocating their space differently? Um, are you seeing meeting rooms transition and shift to be something else? Um, what are you seeing with a reallocation of, of space or reallocation of real estate? I think the biggest thing that I was surprised by and is not only the re like having more private spaces, um, definitely, you know, still having open collaborative spaces, but also the shift to more private spaces, even for flexible workspace. And um, that we recently been doing a, a project for a company who was a hybrid pre-pandemic and now is a remote first company. Mm. Uh, so it's remote first and looking at really creating spaces that are 
more larger gathering spaces, and then also smaller, smaller spaces, smaller um, spaces where coders can come and do focus work because they can't do it at home. Um, so I, I think it's it's really about uh, listening again to the end users and the people who are in working in the space and what do the people that you want to bring back into the space. I think the, the other big thing is that I would say taking away from this pandemic is if, and, it's, and even with this remote first client, it's like if you're bringing people together, it's that user experience. Like what is the experience? Like you have to make it worth the, whether it's the commute, whether it's the, we're getting all these people together and people have a, a level of, um, maybe there's some people who may not be as comfortable being together with with a group. Like, how do you address all that? So making it worth the the visit. So that user experience is really important. I think we've been also paying attention to uh, like establishing personas for the kinds of users that our clients have. So those personas, you know, whether they're someone who's fully task based or they're a traveler or you know they're they're an educator or whatever it might be. Um, when you establish those personas and you start to um, you start to start to define what those spaces are going to need to be for people to to use, I think what I'm encouraged by is the the attention that's paid by leadership to recognize that there are really a lot of different ways that they need to use the space as opposed to just a one to one workstation scenario with you know a seat per ten people in the office for conference rooms and things like that. I, so I think the ability to to craft that usage um, is good, and so we start to develop spaces differently based on what those personas dictate. And I think that there's a flexibility and a fluidity and an openness that um, we're experiencing right now that we haven't seen before. I would say also that um, there's definitely an emphasis on learning and education spaces. Mm -hmm. um, whether that's around technology training or just onboarding and training up new employees. I mean, people are changing jobs left and right, shifting careers, coming out of retirement. I mean, there's a huge need for training and learning. Um, and so, you know, where those spaces are located also, I'm seeing, you know, kind of interesting thought around that um, at the front door. So it's easy to get in and out around, you know, even, even completely rethinking the, the arrival um, experience for people around, you know, uh, not going through a formal reception area or something like that, but actually entering into a gathering kind of social space, um, as well as outdoor spaces. I'm amazed at the number of new buildings going up, new construction in a climate that, you know, you can use outdoor spaces maybe half the year, <laughs> um, putting an emphasis on terraces, rooftops, um, that outdoor space, which I think is just fantastic. Tied to the education and learning piece, and we have a number of students and a number of um, designers who've just started working. Uh, they have new jobs at new firms. And so there are a number of questions asking the three of you for advice. What advice would you give to someone first starting at a firm or to a, a design student? Ask lots of questions always. And, and don't, even in this remote world, don't be afraid to call somebody, to team someone or, or, you know, set up a Zoom call. Like you're not, most people are so excited to connect with a, a new person, uh, someone they're not seeing um, on a daily basis. And so I would, that would be my biggest advice. And, you know, definitely listen, but ask a lot of questions, um, really uh, reaching out and not being afraid to reach out to um, your colleagues. Yep, find your mentors. Um, they're not, it's, it's unlikely that you will have one mentor in your career. Um, they come in all shapes and sizes and from all different sorts of unexpected places. Um, for me personally, I found that, you know, seeking out mentors for different things helped me kind of um, create kind of the leadership style that works for me. Um, and I would also suggest um, going in and meeting in person, um, you know, go to your office, spend yeah. some time in the library, uh, talk to people, um, that, that human connection, it will um, expedite or exponentially increase your connection with uh, your teammates. I would say, 
expose yourself to the different to the different disciplines within the design field. Mm. Make sure that you acquaint yourself with um, project management, uh, technical roles, in addition to the design role, to make sure that you get a good exposure to all three of those because the greater knowledge that you have on, on how a project work, works holistically, um, the bigger asset you'll be. Fantastic advice. And one last question for the panel. It's just a slight twist on the the last question uh, that I said I was going to ask you. What are you What are you inspired and optimistic about right now? I see a little bit of thinking, but I'm coming to you first, Anne. What are you inspired and optimistic about right now? You know, I'm optimistic about change. Sorry about that. Um, you know, change. Any kind of change needs design thinking. And that's what gets me excited. You know, whether a company is growing or shrinking or moving or staying put, um, you know, we are problem solvers. And so um, we have the biggest problem that I've ever encountered in my career as a designer right in front of us right now. And so, you know, the, and, and everybody seems to be open to new ideas. And so pulling in I've got a cultural anthropologist that works with me and I pull him into conversations in ways that I would not have been able to do, you know, five years ago. So um, I'm excited for, for change. Yeah. Thank you for that, Anne. And I know you've got to jump off and jump into another thank call. So, thank you so much. Thank you. Great to see you all. Hi. Uh, Suzette, Chris, what are you optimistic and inspired by? Uh, I'm, I'm really optimistic about this, you know, the humanistic aspect and how we, this idea of empathy. And um, I really do believe we're gonna make the right decisions and uh, I'm kind of an optimist at heart. And so that to me is, is interesting. The fact that people actually care about one another and are willing to listen to one another. So that's something uh, I'm taking forward and that's gonna be my charge. That's great, that's fantastic. Chris? I think, uh, I think for me it is, um, the way that the, the space is viewed and the evolution that we've seen um, housing workstations to really being a serious reflection of an organization's culture and um, how, potential, how potentially wonderfully those spaces can be addressed in order to reflect who, truly reflect who is in there. And uh, it's less utilitarian and more culturally and brand specific, which I, th I find exciting. Thank you. Thank you for that. And also, Chris, hashtag track suit. <laughs> I wasn't going to let that go. Um, I want to thank the uh, panelists. Thank you all in the audience, um, but particularly the panelists for their very apt, relevant, and of the moment thoughts and expertise um, in helping us decipher um, whatever the workplace of today means. It's really the experience place, I think. Um, so thank you to the panelists and thank you to the audience.